Hello and welcome to Football Night New York Living Room Edition. I'm Janae Coakley alongside Jamal Westerman and Bart Scott. And guys, as we're seeing this week, there are more important things in sports and athletes are standing up for what they believe in. They are tired of these social injustices and they're done. They're boycotting. They're not playing games because they want things done. You saw the NBA. You saw Major League Baseball. You saw the WNBA. You saw Major League Soccer. You saw teams coming together saying, we're not playing because we need to make a difference after the shooting of Jacob Blake. When you see these reactions as men of color, as men who's been through this, what's your reaction, Bart? I mean, what happens after the looting? What happens after the rage? We need solutions. And it was a lot of um, NBA players that were skeptical, skeptical of going into the bubble because they believed that the message would be lost. And those who decided to go in the bubble said, you know what, we should use our platform. And I thought the NBA did a tremendous job and with a Black Lives Matter and, and allowing guys to have their, their, their social justice um, names on the back of their jerseys. But then the message started to get lost. And then we see, you know, we were still, you know, the NBA players were in there talking about Breonna Taylor. And as we we're talking about justice for Breonna Taylor, now we have justice for Jacob Blake. It's like, well, the only way we can get attention is to put a halt to what people love the most. And that's watching sports. It's the only place where you can have people from both sides of the aisle, um, political views, religious views. And that's the beauty of sports, to come together. Well, if I stop your regularly scheduled programming, then I'm going to have your attention. And I think yesterday was a symbol of, listen, the players realize that they can't do it themselves. You know, what they need, they need help and they need power, right? Because they understood that they hurt the owners yesterday by not playing. But in turn, the owners have power because we, we put up a list of all the owners of sports who, who donate to all these campaigns, right? And it's a whole list of them that donate millions of dollars. Well, they have power. They have influence. They have influence that the players can't have to push legislation. So if they, if they use that power and, and players are demanding that they use that power for, so that you can get legislation, so that they can have lobbyists in Washington, D.C., trying to make real change. Because you can, you, can change, you can loot, you can riot, you can protest. But until we get laws put in place to protect the people that they're supposed to love, and, and, and admire because you know they all say when they when they come in there and they sign you they say listen if you need anything come to us well if you listen to Kendrick per Perkins this morning he's saying we're coming to you now he's saying we need your help because we can only take the baton so far we have to hand it off to you because you have influence you're talking about 22 billionaires in the NBA you're talking about another 30 or 32 we're talking 50 billionaires if 50 billionaires come together then they can move the world they can change the world. The athletes can't do it alone. And you hear, I mean, people will say, well, these are millionaires. These are, you know, successful, educated men. They don't, what do they care, these athletes? Jamal, you played football, but you're always, at the end of the day, a black man. When you see these teams, like the Jets didn't have practice, the Colts didn't have practice, the NFL now is standing up. What does it mean to you? And are, what do you think of these guys doing this right now? I think like Bart mentioned, you know, we talk about platform. I mean, the players have used their platform in many ways. They've used it to sell jerseys. They've used it to sell soft drink, to sell cars. But the most important thing about their platform now is to help themselves, right? As a black man, you have this platform. You're playing professional sports. You're playing collegiate sports. You know, you're doing everything. You're trying to, the weight of it is heavy because you're always trying to carry yourself at a certain level because, you know, you, you not only do you represent yourself, but you feel like you have to represent the entire black community. So you try to carry yourself the right way. You try to speak properly. You try to do all the things right. And then you watch that video and you see a, a young black man shot down seven times in the back. And that's the part I think is this most disheartening that you watch it. And I think a lot of the players, especially, you know, the teams, uh, the Jets cancel practice. And one thing they said is, you know, when we leave one Jets drive and I take off the jersey, I'm just a regular black man. Right. So that could have been me. And I think as a player, you understand that that guy was no different from me. You know, an altercation happened, but he was shot in the back. So that could have been me. That could be my brother, one of my teammates saying, I think by the NBA, you know, boycotting the game, stopping playing, postponing, whatever you want to call it, I think they're putting pressure not only on the owners, but it's just for the, you know, the people that watch the game. This is the problem, that this can be us. There's no difference between me and Breonna Taylor. There's no difference between me and George Fuller. This is us. And I think that's what you see a lot of the NBA and all the sports, NBA, WNBA, NFL, all the sports are standing up and speaking up because time, it's time to make a change and time to do something. And I think it's also important that your white teammates see it because, you know, my father's black. 
my husband's black. I have a young brown boy who I don't want in 10 years to have to tell, you know what, you can't wear a hoodie. I can't, shouldn't fear that he's not going to come home. Like you said, yeah, you guys are millionaires. And Jamal, you said, if, you know, I have to speak the right way. You have to do it. That's not fair. You shouldn't have to live like that because your white teammates don't have to live with it. And I feel like for the first time in a long time, I think these white teammates are actually getting it. Do you see that part? No, oh, absolutely, because they're, they're, they're bearing witness to all the issues that the African-American players have to bring into the locker room. It's not just about football, right? We hear Anquan Bolden and why he decided to retire is because his, his cousin got killed by a cop while he was trying to change a tire, right? And, and that's what sparked him. So you see these stories, and that's why the owners have to, have to use their platform and their power, because they know the athlete. They know the player. You know, no, where other place outside of the sports arena where white people be able to have these intimate relationships with African-American men? They don't. So what happens is they don't have the connection. They don't understand the things that we deal with because they don't understand the day-to-day -day issues that we have to deal just getting to work. You know, understanding that when you leave that, that, that stadium, those same people that cheered you look down on you if they don't know who you are. For me to have the same opportunities, I shouldn't have to be able to do something but what 1% of society can do. You know, for me to be able to live and go to the same restaurants, I have to be special, right? I, I live here and I got a beautiful house, beautiful house. I'm one of the best athletes in the history of the world, right? Anybody that makes it to the NFL, NBA, professional sports, are like, you know, my, like my teachers say, you have a better chance of getting struck by lightning. I got struck by lightning. You know what the hell my neighbor do? He a dentist. He's an eye doctor. I don't have any and other Barb, people at the end of the day, that look like me. Bart, you still are brown. Your still skin is, it doesn't matter how nice your house. It doesn't matter that you deserve this and you earned it. You're still brown, so you're still looked upon as a threat, and these are what you guys are fighting for. Exactly. You should see the, the eyes I get when I first moved here, when I went to the grocery store, like I wasn't supposed to be there. How many times I got pulled over? And I tell this all the time. How many times I got pulled over on my way to work because of the type of car I'm driving in the neighborhood I'm in? That shouldn't, it, listen, if that doesn't outrage you, then, then I don't know if I need to be speaking to you. You're the, you're the type of person that we can't save. And Jamal, when you hear people, I mean, you said racism, there's no cure for racism. And racism has been in our country. Our country was built on racism. So right. it's not going to disappear immediately. There's not an immediate result. But what are, what are these athletes doing, Jamal, that will help trans bring, bring this problem to the forefront? And, you know, how proud are you of that? I think, you know, just seeing all the athletes, I think the one thing you've seen ever since, and I, it happened before, but since Cap took the knee that more of the athletes are getting informed, right? Guys are reading more. Guys are finding out who am I voting for? Who are the, you know, the district attorneys in my area? Who's the governor? Who are the local officials, politicians in the area that might vote, you know, that the information I get can change some of the things that's happened in my community. Then you see guys in the locker room having more conversations with each other. You know, you guys mentioned having conversations with teammates that come from different backgrounds and letting them know that, you know, listen, man, this is exactly how it is and this is how I feel. And I think from that you've seen, because it's going to take more than just black men to make a change. It's going to take strong, powerful white men to come in there too and make a change because at the end of the day, they've always been at the top of this country. So I think that conversation needs to continue to be had. And then at the end of the day, it's making change. And what you've seen a lot of these organizations do, a lot of, you know, the people that work with the player coalition, that they're starting to try to make a change in their communities right there, right? And I think that's the one of the, the most things that I've seen as a positive thing is that you've seen a lot more people being informed, having a conversation. They're going into their communities, right? They're going into their community, their local mayor's office, and they're trying to make a change in their communities. And that's the first thing. But you know, and from hopefully from that change in their communities, now you're seeing the worldwide changes in America that, listen, yes, it's only sports, right? We're only talking about sports here. This is not life or death, but we know it affects a lot and there's a lot of money going through the economy of sport. And we all know that the money can change things. And, you know, we hope for one day that it's not going to take, like, hey, we need money to stop getting black people killed. You know, we need money to, you know, police, to stop police brutality. We need money to stop, you know, excessive, excessive force used against black men and women, black and brown men and women. You know, hopefully it'll come a day that it won't be a, my, a money thing, it won't be an economic thing, it won't be a boycott thing. And it'll be, you know what, that's the right thing to do. That's, that's what I would want for my son, my brother, my mother. And hopefully that day will come. But as we can see now, it is better, but it's nowhere close to where it needs to be.
to, and, to, and I think to, sports is such a powerful tool. And I commend these athletes for using their platform. I mean, look at Muhammad Ali. Look at what he had to do. Bill Russell. I mean, you got LeBron James, and he just said, I'm sick of this. But like, how, how ironic that we're fighting the same fight that Muhammad 19, Ali fought yeah. and Martin Luther King fought 50 years ago, right? Or 60 years ago. Like, that 1960 civil rights movement wasn't that long ago. And we still haven't had the progress that we need. We still have the same conversations that they had, right? And that's why I think athletes are like, you know what? We're tired of marching. You know, we're going to put pressure because now the great thing is with social media and because everybody is their own reporter, they're starting to see this. And, and Jamal, real quick, do you think this is going to help? Do you feel the change? Do you feel this is more of a movement than a moment? I definitely feel it's more of a movement because everybody's in it together. Right. I mean, I think all the black athletes are in there, all the teams are not only the black athletes, the white athletes, you, it's the conversation, right? I think that's the most important thing that you're not used to having these tough conversations in locker rooms. I don't think I was, I ever had these tough conversations in locker rooms maybe before three or four years ago. And I played, you know, sports for a long time. So you didn't have these conversations. Now you're having the conversation. Yep. Now people are talking about it. And like you said, the more that the high profile non-black athletes continue to stand with their brothers that you say, this is my brother in the locker room. This is the guy I'm going to sacrifice for. This is my offensive lineman who's protecting me. The more they keep standing up, the more the more it's going to make a change. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones that sell the jerseys, especially in football when you talk about the quarterbacks and everything. And you have seen some of them step to the plate and put their name behind stuff. But it has to be a constant thing, not only when somebody's murdered unjustly by the police officers, but on a daily basis, on a, a constant thing. Because it's not only way to a hashtag pop up to do something, you know, if you're a non-black athlete. Just continue to do something, continue to push for the change that you want to see. Jamal, you're, you're Canadian, right? You're Canadian? Yes. Do a, do a citizen. Right. The NHL just canceled their playoff games. Now, we know that the NHL doesn't have the same money that the NBA has. They have a bubble. We know the NBA is spending $200 million for a bubble. But them to boycott when most of those players are Canadian, European, and not, and not Russian, black. Right. That's why this is a movement. Not black, right? That's why this is a movement. Because if basketball would have, would have stepped alone out there by themselves, then they would have been they would have been pointed that they would have been isolated. If football would have did it, they would have been like, okay, those are all majority black. But when NASCAR and when NHL steps up, that means that now we have power because individually we weak, but together collectively as athletes, we're making a fist, and that's powerful. So it is a movement, and we have to make sure that we keep this momentum. We make sure that we will not be denied, and we do not forget. We continue applying pressure on these billionaires. I really do believe that this is a movement, and I feel like, you know, I'm hoping in 10 years from now, our sons won't have to be dealing with the extent of what you guys deal with on a daily basis. For Jamal Westerman, Bart Scott, I'm Janae Coakley. We'll see you next week.